So our next speaker um, in our run showcase is uh, Mr. Bill Higley. Bill is an attorney with Aegis Law, and he focuses on business startups and transactions. Today, he will be discussing estate planning. It's not just for old people. <laughs> Bill? <laughs> He didn't say that. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll say that, but thank you very much. All right. That's very good. Thank you. It's not just for old people. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to our guests, and be careful what you say. I'm wearing a wire. <laughs> so um, here we are. This is wonderful. We'll uh, get this uh, started. I'm going to talk about uh, estate planning uh, for business owners, and it's a huge topic. It's, it's uh, an, enormous, an enormous topic, and so in an effort to, uh, to break it down and to stay within the confines of, of our uh, program, which is extremely difficult, um, I decided to make it um, of interest to the businesses represented in this room and, uh, and on our Zoom. And those businesses primarily are owner-managed businesses. Uh, they're service businesses and consulting businesses primarily. What we have here, um, heavy on intellectual property and light on capital assets. So uh, not many businesses in this room own a line of punch presses or a garage full of earth moving equipment, although we consult with businesses like that. Uh, and so the estate planning that I'm going to talk about here is, uh, is, is primarily of interest to owner managed consulting uh, businesses. Now, uh, Thad said primarily for old people, that's one of the reasons why it's easy to avoid, very easy to avoid. And um, uh, it's easy to avoid because it's commonly associated with death and mortality and old people, uh, none of whom uh, we, we have seem to have showed up here today. Uh, and it's thought of also as something that is separate from the business that is a, a different activity in the, uh, in the business, maybe a personal problem, a family problem, a family uh, challenge. So I'm going to suggest, I'm going to suggest a, uh, a different approach here. Um, and um, it's also um, often misunderstood. It's seen as a challenge. Um, and it's true that the law is changing. There's no question about that. And it's not getting any simpler. Um, but that, what that means, though, for us is that the, the, the challenge, if you will, is to understand what you can do on your own and what you need to uh, have a, uh, an attorney for. In other words, when to call in a pro. So every one of us uh, in, that, in this room, uh, the businesses that we have, uh, all have that same kind of challenge, if you will. Know when to call in a pro. And we all tell our clients when to call in a pro. We all tell our clients that uh, professional advice uh, can, um, uh, can produce fantastic results in your business. There's much you can do on your own because you're, after all, a partner with the, uh, uh, with the professional uh, resource. This room is full of professional resources. Um, so enough with the, um, uh, with the avoidance, enough with the uh, intimidation of the challenge. Maybe you need some um, motivation. There we go. Um, uh, and uh, what I'm going to suggest to you is, what if thinking about estate planning is the same kind of thinking you bring to your business every day? What about, what if it's no greater or complex a challenge than you face every day in your business, and that it's really business as usual rather than unusual? So, um, let's see here. We have a uh, technical uh, difficulty, maybe. There we are. Okay. So, I'm going to limit this to three topics, three topic areas. First, I'm going to suggest a way to think about this um, uh, and in terms of moving decisions upstream, things to do before you even call an attorney. Then I'm going to talk about some practical tools in your toolbox, and those are two groups, what you can do on your own and what you need an attorney to do. And then third, uh, you might want to think about a couple of possibilities, a couple of other things. There are some gotchas out there. There are some things that will, uh, if not hurt you, at least 
uh, create undesirable results unless you know about them. So um, with those, um, there we go. So objective, so uh, estate planning basically has two objectives for all assets that are, are included in estate planning. One is, and these are, these are what you do in your business, uh, one is how to make it more valuable, how to make your assets more valuable, how to grow them, how to enhance or grow their value. And secondly, how to make it easy to transfer, easy for whoever succeeds to this business interest to pick it up, right? So first on building value, making uh, your business more valuable is something you do every day. Uh, it's your guiding focus. You're constantly refining and learning and exploring um, and adding value. Because after all, sooner or later, what's left of your business is going to be cash. Hopefully, in your pockets, in your family's pockets. I tell clients all the time that most businesses fall into one of two broad uh, cash models, uh, one of two broad categories the business is either going to create something of lasting value that you can sell and realize uh, uh, cash from that, from a transfer of the business. That's the build a piece of the rock model. Or it's going to be something that generates a stream of income, which hopefully will uh, grace your retirement coffers at some point and your, and your family's uh, assets. So that's the, uh, the take the money and run. So what are the obstacles to getting in the way of this? Uh, disorganization on the one hand, internal disorganization in all its forms, then lack of control over externalities that affect the business or conflict among uh, equity holders and owners. All of those things create what's called a fixer-upper, and a fixer-upper business is of less value because somebody has to remedy that disorganization, somebody has to remedy that conflict, somebody has to uh, reestablish control in order to make the business uh, uh, make the business better. So it may seem obvious, but uh, don't pay your attorney to do uh, things that you can do yourself. So you need to define your objectives and expectations for estate planning. Remember, it's a process of transfer, transfer of value, transfer of value out and retaining value for yourself. So none of the transfer uh, strategies that you can do yourself um, uh, are permanent and they can all be integrated into a larger plan if you decide to go that route with an attorney. So uh, define your objectives and expectations. Understand wherein the value lies in your business. Is it product? Is it the uniqueness of your service? Is it customer relationships? Is it a database? Is it... Uh, uh, relationships uh, or particular technical expertise that you have? Is it all right here? Or is it in a document or um, uh, intellectual property that you've created? So we're going to talk about uh, tools in your toolbox. Uh, some of these are things that you can do yourself. Others are things that you need an attorney for. So uh, things that you can do without an attorney are relate to accounts and titles, PODs and TODs, pay on death is a POD, transfer on death is, is the TOD. These are things that you can walk into any bank, any customer service representative and say, I want my account to be uh, done with a TOD, with titled merchandise like an automobile. You go to the, to the uh, license office and say, I want this car title reissued with a TOD on it. Now, TODs are basic and easy. Uh, these are part of what are called the non-probate transfer uh, uh, statutes. So PODs, TODs, and what are called um, uh, beneficiary deeds in real estate are all in one statute in Missouri called the Non-Probate Transfers Act. Um, so we're going to get into real estate deeds uh, a little bit uh, later. That's really not something that you can do by yourself as easy as PODs and TODs. Another thing you can do is, if it's comfortable for you, add another owner, a joint owner. Um, and um, uh, because the joint owner takes title upon the death of the, uh, of the original owner. Um, 
one thing here I want to I want to share is uh, uh, passwords and log on information for digital assets. I'm going to talk about digital assets a little bit later. It's extremely important to share those passwords, log ons, and access because your term of service agreement makes that asset just like a safe deposit box in a bank. Everybody understands if the box owner, the safe deposit box owner, uh, passes away, the bank will seal the box if they find out about that. And then you have to go through the probate court to get in. Terms of service agreements are the same way. So share those passwords or at least have them accessible. Know where people can, uh, can get them. So avoiding probate court. We mentioned probate court earlier. The short answer is you don't need to know any of this to lead a very satisfying life. If you can avoid it, your quality of life may even be enhanced. You're not going to miss any experience with the probate court at all as you go through life. So the probate process is complicated. I've been practicing since 1977, and I've never, ever, ever heard anyone say that they've had a satisfying or helpful experience with the probate court. <laughs> never. So I think Dante said it best in the Inferno, over the gates of hell, it says, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. <laughs> so it's not as bad. They've simplified the process a little bit. St. Louis County is a little bit better. But don't go near the place. Uh, your life will be fine uh, without it. So that means take strategies to avoid uh, probate. So for these two classes of strategies here, the last will and testament and uh, various types of trusts, you'll need an attorney. You'll need, there are online forms. And people ask me all the time, do those online forms work? Are they legal? Yeah, they're legal. They're absolutely, a court will enforce those. So that means that they'll work for somebody. Whether it's you or not is a different question. And as all the professionals, the consultants in this room know, in order to tailor your objective uh, to a strategy, it's best to call in a pro to do this. Now, uh, last wills and testaments, uh, they're good. It's a, it's a beautiful document, but it's of absolutely no effect until you're into probate court. There's that place again. So um, uh, it's expensive, ends up being time-consuming, limited control. Uh, probably two years to get through St. Louis County, a year and a half easily. Right in the middle of the proceeding is a six-month window for creditors to file claims, and everything comes to a standstill for six months while we wait for creditors to file claims. So you're not in control of that. Uh, various types of trusts are the most versatile and comprehensive tool. They allow you to retain control, to plan for contingencies. Uh, it's, a, it's not a testamentary document. It's important to remember. It is a contract. It is a, a contract that's governed by a separate section in the statutes called the Missouri Uniform Trust Code. But it is a contract. It is not a probate um, uh, proceeding. Um, so they require work to set up, uh, work to manage. Um, uh, we'll also avoid what are called living probate situations, which are guardianships and conservatorships, which happen after people suffer strokes, disabilities, Alzheimer's uh, disease, uh, things like that, that result in their incap uh, incapacity to, uh, to manage their uh, affairs. Uh, if you don't have a trust, you are stuck with going to probate court. Uh, so all of this planning ahead is... Um, what you do in your business again every day. So these are some things you might want to know about. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about three of them very briefly. First is uh, the Missouri Uniform Trust Code and Asset Protection Trusts. So routinely now, we write trusts so that gifts to beneficiaries are given to the beneficiary, not outright, and free of trust, but they are given in the form of an irrevocable trust of which that beneficiary is the sole trustee. Missouri permits this. Other states do not. Missouri permits an individual to be the trustee of their own irrevocable trust. The enormous advantage there is protection uh, from creditors, very strong protection from claims of creditors. So these could be a commercial creditor, former spouse, judgment creditors, may enable the beneficiary to avoid bankruptcy if they can avoid 
the um, uh, the claim of um, uh, let's see here with uh, to uh, avoid the um, uh, at, uh, a fight with a creditor or a claim of a uh, a creditor. Now the fiduciary assets to digital assets act. This is uh, Missouri has this and Illinois has this. So this is a uh, statute that overrides overrides the terms of service agreements. Um, for those who bank on their phone, not only is the phone, but also the accounts to which the phone is linked. They're considered digital assets under the statute. And um, uh, uh, under the terms of service agreements, both of those will be locked up upon that. So I had a real situation. I've told many of, of you this story. Client walked in with a foreclosure notice and a uh, phone of her father. Her father had suddenly passed away and she walked in with a foreclosure notice because it's the other great uh, no-no as far as I'm concerned, which is a reverse mortgage. Father had taken out a reverse mortgage and hadn't told anybody about it. And he passed away suddenly. Of course, didn't make the mortgage payment because he banked on his phone. And she gets a foreclosure notice. In Missouri, foreclosure can take as little as three weeks. So it's very, very, very fast in contrast to Illinois. She walked in, she had the phone. She said, that's not a problem. I'll get myself appointed personal representative and I'll be able to get those passwords. No, unfortunately. And she lost the home to foreclosure. So um, the override uh, requires that uh, the, uh, the requisite language be in either a trust or a will. That's why I say, if you're not gonna go with a trust or a will, share those passwords, share those logons get that written down someplace, go to the third drawer on the left on my desk and you get all my passwords, things like that, okay? Uh, one final thing, very briefly, the SECURE Act, this is for retirement assets. Under the prior law, uh, we could use stretch IRAs, we could stretch out retirement benefits, that's no more. It's now limited to 10 years. Um, and, um, uh, Roth, uh, I mean, retirement plan distributions other than Roth accounts are ordinary income and taxable. So if you have to take them over a shorter period of time, your tax burden is probably going to be higher. This is not true for Roth uh, accounts. But the trustee, the trust can now be a designated beneficiary with proper language. And so what we do is we write those so that the trustee can take those distributions and spread them out over a longer period of time. Not as good as a stretch uh, uh, distribution, but uh, it's about the best we can do. So uh, I'm well out of time. So um, if there's any questions with the indulgence of the crowd here, um, be happy to take more time. Thank you. Microphone. Uh, could you go back to that slide where you had the last will and testament and uh, something about the probate? I'll tell you when. There. <clears throat> says last will and testament. This requires a probate court proceeding. If for, you have for a, it to be effective. Okay. I guess you know, I have will and testament. To other people that I know have my parents have will and testament, a last will and testament. Does it require some kind of probate court? Am I misunderstanding that? Mm -hmm. The will, the will has to be admitted to probate first, oh. and then in Missouri, it's a separate proceeding. Uh, the uh, personal representative, typically a family member, has to file a petition in the probate court in order to be appointed a personal representative and to be invested with the legal authority to carry out the directions of the will. Other than that, any influence it has is purely moral. That's all it is. There's no legal effect to the document without it being, uh, as it's called, admitted to probate. Okay. Yes, Dale. Yeah, uh, Bill, it's my understanding that a lot of attorneys do a will, even though they're creating the trust for people in, in the event that something that isn't listed in the trust, that it's covered through the last will. Mm -hmm. Is that true? It's true. Uh -huh. That's the... the uh, the name that's commonly used for that is a poor over will, P-O-U-R, as if out of a picture, poor over will. And that is because 
the trust is effective only as to assets that are registered to the trust. So if an account is registered just to Bill Higley, and I have this trust, this beautiful trust, the trust has nothing to do with that account. If the account is registered to Bill Higley, trustee of Bill Higley's trust, then the trust governs uh, the administration of that account, okay? Now, it happens all the time that assets go through, and there's a very structured process to make sure that we catch them all and get them into the trust. Uh, but it happens all the time. Uh, people may, for one reason or another, not put an asset into the trust. If they die and that asset is owned solely by them, not in joint ownership with anybody else, solely by them, then that asset is subject to probate jurisdiction. So then, but the probate court can't do anything without a petition. And so people put this will together, have this will to catch those assets that for one reason or another were not caught by the trust, were not registered by the trust. So that's, that's why we work those in tandem. It's kind of a safety device. Um, purpose of the trust is to avoid probate. And so hopefully if all the assets are, are registered to the trust, uh, the will will not be necessary. Okay. Yes, Bill. Bill, I have a question. If a trust is created in Missouri, a trustee will state rules be ever change or follow It's typical to put language in the trust that specifies the jurisdiction under which it will be interpreted. So we typically say this is a Missouri trust or this will be interpreted under the laws of Missouri. Uh, you mentioned New Mexico. New Mexico is a community property state. And so it very often happens. Missouri is a common law state. So that pertains to ownership of assets uh, between married people. And so people move to other states they retire to Arizona. They have their Missouri trust. The tr if they don't uh, change the trust, then the trust will be in, continue to be interpreted under Missouri law or whatever jurisdiction it says. So that's while they're living, but what about after death? The, trust, so the trustee can then they change it or is it always going to be you know, at the point that the trust? Uh, typically, the trustee uh, cannot change the trust after death, but that will be addressed in the language. Um, yes. Uh, let's, we, we probably need to make this the last question. Go hello? ahead. Um, okay. That's a lot of information, but um, which, so I, I heard, I've heard about wills and trust. Does the trust trumps a will? Like, is it, does a trust have more legal power over a will or does it, is it like, it depends on how the trustee and the trust owner manages that will. It's more the latter uh, because um, the, uh, the trust is a contract. And so it has all the legal power of a contract. So very frankly, some people don't obey contracts. Some people don't, some people breach them. Some people don't do what they're supposed to. But it's the same case under a will, that the, the difference is that the will has a probate court order that enforces the provisions of the will. The trust is, is like an ordinary contract. It's just governed by a separate section under the statutes called the trust code, typically as three parties. You're not, no. no. There's no probate jurisdiction over assets that are held in a revocable living trust. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Apologize for the long-winded. Thank you. Thank you.